So I was, uh, I was debating whether or not to wear my glasses up on stage. I'm just getting to that point where if I look down to see the screen, it's a little fuzzy and I might not be able to see my notes without them. And as I went through that debate, one of my uh, colleagues at the table looked over and said, you look a lot smarter with your glasses on. So in that case, I'm absolutely using glasses today. Um, just want to say thank you to, uh, to Tal and, P and the uh, PMWC for the invitation to speak today. Uh, I'm going to take about 15 minutes here, and I'm going to cover a lot of ground, but my key focus is going to be on the clinical applications of next generation sequencing. I do want to start off with a brief in introduction to foundation medicine, not necessarily as an advertisement, but because I think it sets the stage for the rest of the talk. I'll also talk about why next-gen sequencing. Why do we care so much about next-gen? You heard it from Stefan. You know, uh, you heard it from Dr. Drucker er earlier. Why are we so focused on next-gen sequencing today in the arena of, of cancer diagnostics? And then finally, which uh, it really gives me a lot of pleasure to talk about this next topic today, and that is the data that we are generating as a company. Six months ago, I was really not in the position because we didn't have a lot of clinical data. But this is, this is stuff that we're actually doing today. And I'm going to talk through some, some anecdotes. And now, you know, anecdotes are anecdotes. However, as you heard from Dr. Drucker, these things add up over time. A patient vignette today turns into a small study tomorrow, turns into something very meaningful down the road. So I would argue that all these, all these anecdotes and all these uh, patient vignettes that we're hearing about today will, in fact, have an enormous impact in terms of guiding targeted seek targeting therapy over time. So Foundation Medicine, um, Foundation Medicine is a molecular information company. And our mission and vision all relate to our desire to have a significant positive impact on patient-centered ca cancer care. Uh, our founders are really some of the pioneers in cancer genomics and cancer biology. The investors that we have behind a company with Third Rock Ventures, Kleiner Perkins, as well as Google Ventures are, are wonderful financial investors, but I always make the point that they are, in fact, strategic investors. Uh, Third Rock gives us great insight into what's happening into the pharmaceutical world. Kleiner Perkins uh, and their understanding of the diagnostic space, what's happening with reimbursement, what's happening on the regulatory side. We can all do wonderful science, we can do wonderful clinical trials, but unless we nail the reimbursement piece and the regulatory piece, it's all for nothing as well. And then finally, Google Ventures. We're talking about immense, an immense amount of, clinical, of genomic data. We're talking about the need to mine that information. And then finally, it's really all the way on the back end, not just mining that information, but translating it, translating for, for, for oncologists, translating this information for patients, developing user interfaces to do that in a way that's never been done before. And Google Ventures, I can honestly say, has really opened up the, the keys to the, uh, to the Google domain so we get access to, uh, to all these areas. Our company brings a broad set of core competencies in genome technology, cancer biology, clinical oncology, and information sciences. And these are skill sets that are really needed to develop a transformative company uh, that aims to change the way molecular information is not only generated, but utilized by oncologists, by pharmaceutical companies, even by patients, by regulators, uh, and by payers. We utilize, we utilize an end-to-end, next-gen-based approach to work with pharmaceutical companies today. We are deeply embedded in many clinical trials as they look for, as they look, uh, as they look for ways to differentiate and, and stratify patients within trials, as they think about products that have failed unexpectedly in phase three trials, and they want to go back and assess that type, and they want to assess that information. But this information that's coming out of our work with pharma is also driving an important cancer diagnostic business that we have, which kicked off in earnest in Q4 of last year. And then finally, the content is all coming back, and we're using registries and reaching out to the oncologist to follow patients over time. And we believe long term that this information will, in fact, continue to have tremendous value for the payers, for the, regulators, uh, for the regulators, for oncologists, for pharmaceutical companies, and again, even for patients. So at the core of our test is the delivery of a fully informative genomic profile. So what does that mean? That means that we use next-gen sequencing to sequence approximately 200 cancer-related genes. And then we translate that information into actionable tidbits for oncologists and for, ph and for pharmaceutical companies. 
The technology, and I won't go through this in a lot of detail, uh, but it is, in essence, what we do. We don't develop the technology. We bring a best-of-breed processes to the, vari to the technology platforms. We apply our test to formalin-fixed paraffin-embedded tissue. We need very small amounts of tissue. 40 microns of, DNA, uh, of 40 microns of tissue, 50 nanograms of DNA. And so the idea was to take this, so all of the specimens, all of the biopsies, as poor as they may be, that come in the door, we have a great chance of success in, 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 in obtaining the appropriate information. Um, we, the goal for a clinical diagnostic test, sensitivity and specificity both have to approach 100 percent. That's not easy to do and it's something that we do very well. And then finally, one of the secrets to driving sensitivity and specificity with a hybrid capture-based approach is to drive your coverage as high as possible. And so right now, routinely, we get over 500x coverage, and on many of the cases that we run, we get over 1,000x, we get over 1,000 x coverage. A couple of other points. So our test is a pan-cancer test. It's not built for breast cancer. It's not just built for lung cancer. Today, it's utilized in all solid tumors, and then by the end of this year, we'll have a hematologic malignancy application as well. So why do this? Why do we really care about utilizing next generation sequencing in oncology? So let's look what's happening in the oncology world today. We've heard about molecular assays. We've heard about targeted therapeutics. Everybody in this room is familiar with them. But put yourself, put yourself in the shoes of a community oncologist that's practicing anywhere in the United States or internationally. Today, we have a handful of good molecular assays, and we have a large handful of targeted therapeutics from which to select. It's confusing today. Think about what happens as we go out another year, as we go out five years or 10 years. Today, we have approximately 500 targeted compounds in clinical development within, within pharmaceutical companies. That's an impressive number, but to me what's most impressive is that they're hitting approximately 140 different genes. So again, they're not, all going, they're not all going to be successful. Maybe, uh, you know, if we go back to the Lehman report that Alexis talked about earlier, perhaps we think that there's a small percentage that will be successful, but pick your number. Say 10% of those are successful and they get and they become FDA approved. Maybe you're much more ambitious than that or optimistic than that. You believe that 80% will be improved. If you approve, if you are a community oncologist, it will be impossible to sort through all that information in clinical practice. If I'm a thoracic oncologist up the road at Stanford or I'm at Memorial Sloan Kettering, I can, in fact, know every single thing there is to know about my subspecialty. I will understand every molecular assay I need to run. I will understand every therapeutic that's available, and I, I will most likely know every good clinical trial that's out there. But if I am even the best and the brightest of the community oncologist, and my first patient is lung cancer, my second patient of the day is breast cancer, my third, my third patient has lung cancer, the next one has a rare sarcoma, and so on, there, it will be impossible for me to keep up with that, type of with that type of information. So let's look at today's diagnostic testing model. This is an oversimplification and a generalization, but that's what it's meant to be, so take it for what it's worth. The initial biopsy is taken. It's typically sent to the diagnostic lab at the hospital for the initial workup. A certain set of costs are generated. It takes some time to work through this information. If, in fact, it is a cancer, then the, then the tissue specimen is, ultimate, is, is often sent to another reference lab for some additional testing. And then in a significant percentage of the cases, it even goes out to a third lab for some additional esoteric testing. These add up. The costs add up. The turnaround time adds up. And most importantly, the amount of information adds up. These, this information does not come back to the oncologist in a nice, concise report so he or she can take this information and understand what drugs to give. It comes back as individual reports. Yes, positive, negative mutation. Yes, this re rearrangement existed, and so on and so forth. It's virtually impossible to think about uh, to think about this model going forward. There are some additional challenges as well, not the least of which is that our biopsies are getting smaller and smaller. That's a good thing for patient. We're getting less invasive. But if you have to run four or five or six molecular assays even today, there's a good chance that you're going to run out of tissue on which to, on which to do the testing. Again, extrapolate out another year, extrapolate out a couple of years. 
There are also tremendous challenges in finding the alterations that are of interest to us today. It's not necessarily the alterations that are found at 60% of, of the tumor samples. It's the ones that come, it's, ones, it's the ones that we find with, with, uh, with a, um, uh, with far less frequency. And then finally, it's the heterogeneity of cancer itself. This is not, these are not germline blood specimens where everything looks the same. This is extremely heterogeneous tissue that makes it very challenging. So let's say that we could manage turnaround time. Let's say that we could manage the costs. Let's say that we could manage the small amount of tissue. And let's say we could even manage the information. There's still a requirement, I think, to migrate away from single assays and think about the specific alterations that are ultimately the drivers and the pathways for the disease. And so, again, a lot of this data is very familiar to you, so I'll go through it very quickly. 60% of melanoma cases will have an alteration in BRAF. We know that, but what we now know is that this alteration may in fact be important in a number of other disease states. KRAS, the same thing. We know the importance in colorectal cancer. We know the importance in lung cancer. We're starting to understand the importance possibly in pancreatic cancer, but, but the list goes on. It's impossible to predict all the specific alterations that are the drivers for each patient's specific cancer. So let me, let me go to the key point of the presentation now, and that's really the results. So this first graph that you see is, uh, is rep represents approximately 95 samples, 95 uh, uh, patients with non-small cell lung carcinoma. These were all run in our lab. In these cases, we identified, or in these cases, 31 genes were altered. Okay, that's, that's interesting to note. We saw some data like that earlier. However, what we also know is that in 18, 18 of these genes that were altered can be tied to therapeutics on the market or therapeutics in clinical trials today. By the way, we only routinely test for three molecular assays with non-small cell lung cancer, EGFR, KRAS, and EML4-ALK. And if there's any oncologists in the room, as I'm sure there are, you're smiling when I say routinely because that's only in about 20% of, uh, uh, of the U.S. lung cancer cases today that we actually do that testing. The breast cancer tail looks ex extremely similar. This is a smaller sample set, about 25 or 30, or 30 cases. We only routinely test for one marker, ERB2, today. But look, out of, these, out of these 20 genes that were altered, we can tie 11 of them to therapeutics on the market or in clinical development. Colorectal carcinoma, as we know, more genes are altered. We only routinely test for KRAS today, and, I, and yet, yet in this case, 19 of the 40 altered genes can be tied to drugs in development or drugs on the market. Let's drill down a little bit further. So our lab was CLIA certified in Q4 of 2000, in, in 2011. We started, you know, we started accepting clinical cases as a soft launch. We don't, you know, we're not marketing this right now. But the th we just took the first 36 cases that came in the door. Broad range of solid tumors. It's not breast. It's like anything that uh, this takes all comers. It's not up here, but in the, in the first 36 cases, we only had two failures. If you look at a standard molecular lab today that runs PCR and fish, the average failure rate in the United States today is 20 to 25 percent. So in order to do this right, it is very challenging. It's critical to maintain a low failure rate. We identified approximately 3.1 alterations per case. So it's good. We're not talking about 10 alterations. We're talking about a very manageable number of clinically relevant alterations. What does clinically relevant mean? To us, it means that there's an FDA-approved therapeutic either for that indication or for a different indication, or there's an ongoing clinical trial that hits that, that, that specific genomic alteration. So our test identified three times the number of alterations as the next broadest panel that is on the market today. And if we drill down on that, so if we drill down to the 71% um, of alterations that, that we uniquely identified, approximately 13% of them were insertions, deletions, Almost 30% were copy number alterations, 3% rearrangements, and then again about 28 to 30% substitutions. So that's interesting to note, but what does it mean in terms of actionability? 25 of 36 samples had at least one actionable alteration that would not have been found by standard hotspot screening. These, these classes include copy number alterations with both am amplifications as well as homozygous deletions, indels, and substitutions. 
I wanted to give you now, this is truly an anecdote, okay? This is an N of one, but let me talk about this for a second. Salivary gland tumor. This is just, a, again, a random sample that came in the door clinically. These are uncommon, but as many of you know, not, not rare. Coincidentally, one of my good friends passed away of this disease at the age of 37 about a year ago, about two months before I came to, to Foundation Medicine. Um, we really haven't studied, we as a, as a community have not studied the ge genomic profile of this tumor uh, to any real extent. There are no approved therapies, so what do you get? You get a broad-based chemotherapeutic, and oftentimes these patients are referred to phase one trials. So what did we find? And again, I apologize because this is not published yet. I just had to block out some of the specifics here, which I, which I did on some of the previous slides as well. We identified five alterations that I would call actionable. You can read them, they are tied to therapeutics that are in clinical trials today, not for this indication, but we know that the, that the companies running these trials would certainly accept these patients. Let's look at this, think about this for a second and go back to some of the long tails that identified. If you're a patient or if you're an oncologist and you know that you've already failed a couple lines of therapy or there's no good indication for your therapy or for your disease, simple question, do you want to know? And I think the vast majority, if not all the people in this room, would, are, would say, yes, I would absolutely want to know if it was me, a family member, or one of my, or one of my patients. Uh, I have plenty more that I could go on and talk about. We have, uh, we're doing a lot of work online for applications. We generate this in terms of a molecular pathology report that's readily understood by oncologists, and certainly the pharmaceutical companies appreciate it as well. But again, next gen, and go back to Stefan's point, next gen is where we have to go in molecular diagnostics. There are many different technologies that are emerging. That's a great thing for all of us. We want them all to win. We simply also need to focus on the clinical application to understand what it means for patients. And, uh, and that's what Foundation Medicine does each and every day. Um, I won't get to my last topic on why we've chosen our approach, but I can certainly talk to you about that over the next day or so. So thank you very much. I appreciate it.